Yes, you put out a great report on the airline sector here in China. We're going to dig into that with you in just a few moments. But I want to start off with trade. Does the phase one trade deal, do you think, hold, given your conversations with your Chinese counterparts here in Beijing? Is there a determination to keep this phase one trade deal on track? Or is there a risk that it collapses before those presidential elections in November? Well, let me first state that the European business community was always very critical of this uh, phase one deal. After all, we talk about managed trade, meaning like uh, two countries are getting together to decide what to buy from each other and basically exclude everyone else. So, so in a way, uh, we were very critical. And uh, after the kind of announcement uh, that there's going to be a huge increase in energy imports as well as in other big ticket items. Now, if you look at airplanes, uh, uh, that's going to go. Uh, then if you look at the oil price, so I thought the phase one deal already is pretty much dead. The phase one deal is pretty much dead. And in terms of just the ratcheting up attention since we last spoke to you, and we heard from Wang Yi during the National People's Congress talking about U.S. politicians pushing the two sides towards a new Cold War. What are your members saying to you about how they are digesting this deteriorating relationship between Beijing and Washington? Can they look past it, or are they starting to think about contingencies? Well, I guess we're in the midst of it. I mean, we have really two crises uh, at the same time, the corona challenge as well as uh, the trade war, which now ventures on into a tech war and possibly ends up as a financial war. Uh, and of course, that uh, causes slower growth, it causes complexity. Uh, it's bad for business, regardless if it's Chinese, European, or US. Uh, well, we are mightily worried, of course, about the silly season that uh, the campaign will be basically focusing on China bashing, which is also not very good. So I guess that people uh, will try to lay low, people will withhold investment maybe in order to see how things in the coronavirus trade war shapes up. Uh, uh, this whole environment is not very conducive to business. And yeah, Jörg, I'm glad you brought up the pandemic as well. There's that, and there's obviously the economic fallout that's, that's, that's followed that pandemic on top of the trade war. Now, when we spoke to you last, it was last year, we only had one thing, it was the trade war. Would you say the operating environment for a lot of your members is a lot more difficult now compared to uh, the latter part of last year? Well, economists uh, tell me that this is the end of uh, economic modeling, meaning it's really hard to pinpoint where we're heading for the future. Scenarios now are on work. You have to have three, four different scenarios just to see how things may uh, sh shape up. We have a report coming out next week, our customary uh, confidence survey, and we labeled it navigating in the dark. I think that says it all. No, it's it's very difficult. At the same time, I think it's very important to keep uh, an eye on, on the big picture. Um, you know, if you look into the GDP per capita, the growth potential of China, uh, for the next 10 years, I would say China stands for 30% of global growth, which equals the global growth of uh, all OECD countries together. So in a way, yeah, we have to get worried about this momentary situation. We have to prepare. But at the same time, we should not forget that China is and will remain the biggest market growth story in the years to come. Uh, Jörg, uh, we're... Uh, just give us a sec here. We're just getting the PBOC's reference rate for the day. And just for our viewers, you can just have a look at that as well. It's not exactly something screaming uh, in terms of variance there from, from, from the estimate. So, Jörg, tell me this then. Obviously, as China grows in relevance as well, I have to bring in the Hong Kong story. And I'm sure you've been following the news. In the event that the U.S. revokes Hong Kong's special trading status, I'm curious, how does that, does that affect you and your members indirectly or even directly? Well, of course, it uh, impacts the kind of um, uh, business model that we have been following. We like Hong Kong, Asia's world city, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of information, and so forth. Uh, and uh, so, yes, uh, it's not good as a backdrop, and we hope that uh, uh, it will be not as implemented as we fear it could be. But at the same time, you have to see that actually uh, Trump's actions might not have much leverage. After all, the U.S. Uh, or Hong Kong exports only $1.4 mm. uh, billion uh, dollars to the U.S., uh, so there's not much to, to leave uh, to cut out, whereas uh, the U.S. exports $30 billion into Hong Kong. This is the only country, uh, if you can call it a country in Asia, that has a trade surplus uh, uh, with the United States. So in a way, uh, the U.S. has to be very careful uh, how they're going to do this. The banking system will be challenged, but again, I think it will be minor, smaller banks, 
so I, I think the impact is a little bit overrated. Uh, Jorg, I do enjoy the fact that the European Chamber puts out and looks at topics that deserve closer attention. And this time you put out a report about the airline sector here in China and the challenges that it poses for the European airlines and the European carriers. What is the problem? What is the system here that China's put in place that is causing an issue for European airlines? Well, the report covers market distortions, meaning that uh, we have uh, publicly listed European companies competing against state-owned and state-funded Chinese airlines. Uh, we are lamenting the fact that only two routes are uh, profitable, but China opens up regional roads, routes uh, into Europe and, of course, takes a major market share of moving people between Europe and China. And that is uh, definitely something where you have a fight going on between market share uh, state-induced and, and feasibility. And of course, we go beyond it. Uh, we also uh, say that uh, the slots uh, that is normally now being assigned for the winter season, for example, has to be recalibrated given the demand story that comes up. And of course, we give recommendations such as uh, the Chinese military is controlling 70% of the airspace that leaves 30% for commercial airliners. And we think there can be a lot of reform done in order to get more traffic and all the way down to the airports. Possibly you, when you travel to China, you've experienced that China has the three or fourth worst delayed airports. You have uh, a, a takeoff a slot uh, uh, frequency in Frankfurt, 30 seconds in China, it's two to three minutes. So there's a lot of possibilities in order to increase uh, routes between Europe and China, but on a legitimate basis, not on subsidies. And the domestic market is essentially closed to foreign airlines. Is there any prospect of that changing, you think? No, I don't think so. It's, it's, uh, I, I guess you could, it's also a stretching imagination to see China Eastern flying between Washington, Houston, or between Paris and Warsaw. So I guess uh, we really have to focus on the international routes, uh, and there it has to be level playing field.